Yeah, I like to tie those up. 102. 102? Is that what you said? Yeah. That's what I said. That says 107. Well, those are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wrong. Okay, so let's call the meeting to order. We have some people here. Someone's just walking in. Um, let's see, we have Kevin from Pathstone. I can't read the name of who is on the upper left hand corner. Devin Chapman. Devin, who are you with? Devin, it's up to you if you want to wear a mask. That the sign is for court. I don't have a ticket. Okay. <laughs> hey, Devin. Do you know her? No. Nope. It looks frozen. Okay. So yeah. Hey, Brenda. Welcome. So, let's let's get started. We I had originally said that we would uh, we would have someone from. Um, Pathstone to give us a discussion about grant opportunities, but that person is not available today, and but she's hoping she'll be available next month. Um, but in the meantime, I, I just wanted to tell you that I was reading online, looking at, actually on my phone when I'm sitting in front of the television, I research, and I, I came across this website called Grounded Solutions, and they talk about shared equity, whatever, what's it called? Shared equity, affordable housing. Is that what it's called, Nash? Yeah. yeah. Shared equity, home ownership. And uh, because the um, a couple of the town board members are are really interested in exploring the issues of uh, owner owned uh, affordable housing. This kind of struck my eye. And then I read that actually Habitat knows something about it. So I contacted Nash and yes, indeed, he knows something about it. And I asked him if he could give us an overview of today's meeting. It's really an interesting subject. So yeah. You're yeah. on Nash. All right. So I am by no means an expert in this subject, though I am familiar with it. Habitat as a network um, works with sh shared equity models in some areas. Um, we don't currently do so uh, in Ontario County, but we're exploring that and looking at it. So um, I'll try to give some, some general overview. The, the concept basically is uh, in looking at home ownership and looking at affordability and trying to um, take that initial investment, right? So generally speaking, when we create affordable home ownership, um, there is some sort of subsidy involved to get from what it costs to build, what the fair market value of that home is down to what a family making 50, 60% AMI can afford. Um, and so when you do that, um, looking at shifting the, the ownership model in a way that creates uh, or allows that investment to be carried on uh, through a future sale of the house and serve multiple families. So to try to break that down real quick in a more maybe concrete term. So let's say you have a house that's $200,000 to build. Family can afford to pay $135,000. So you need a subsidy of roughly $65,000 to get into that house. Um, if they were doing that through Habitat in Ontario County right now, we would write a second mortgage um, for, that, for that difference um, that would be forgiven over time. In the future, say 30 years from now, their mortgages are all paid off, they go to sell the house, they have realized all of that uh, subsidy in additional equity in the home, um, and they can go sell the home on, on the fair market and receive uh, you know, the full value of that house. Now that house is no longer affordable because there would need to be another investment of subsidy at that sale. Um, so what the shared equity model does is puts resale restrictions on the house to preserve that initial investment to be utilized for future families. Um, so resale restrictions as in, it needs to be sold to another family, another home buyer within the uh, targeted income range. And by doing so, by accepting those resale restrictions, the buyer is um, getting a reduced uh, tax treatment. So they're essentially being taxed on that property at the resale restricted value rather than the fair market value or the, the development cost of that property. Um, so there's added benefit to the home buyer as is 
benefit to the community because that one time investment is continuing on and on and on. Um, that's kind of the, the, the skinny of it. Um, I know that the Habitat affiliate in the operates in Ithaca, the Tompkins Cortland affiliate, um, has a community land trust that they utilize to do this in the city of Ithaca because the land prices and taxes mm -hmm. in, in Ithaca were making it completely impossible for them to, to subsidize houses to a level that would be affordable. Um, so I could certainly bring somebody in from there to talk more specifically about mm -hmm. the, the mechanisms and how that works. Um, but essentially what would happen is either through a deed restriction or through utilizing a community land trust to um, put in place those resale restrictions, there would be a tax benefit and a long-term affordability component baked in. And this is also a benefit to the mortgage company that's holding the second mortgage also because they retain the uh, appreciation right. uh, on the property. Yeah, so usually, right, so future appreciation of value, there's usually some shared component of that as well where the homeowner isn't is building has the ability to build wealth but isn't building all of it recognizing that there was subsidy involved um, so going back to that two hundred thousand dollar example right i said you know they can afford 135 65 subsidy um, if you did that in a shared appreciation model and therefore treated the the property um, a little bit differently now the family can afford more because the taxes are going to be reduced um, and so in that scenario, you might be able to get a family up to $160,000 and reduce that initial subsidy down to 35, uh, or excuse me, down to 40, um, just by virtue of balancing that, that uh, tax bracket. So the municipality is still receiving taxes. It's not a tax exemption. It's just an adjustment to acknowledge that this house has been permanently restricted as affordable. Could I ask whether this is the same as co-housing. There apparently are five co-housing developments in New York State that I recently read about. Anybody know about that? So co typically co-housing co would be um, folks living in a building or a development where they where they live in a smaller dedicated space. So uh, their dedicated space might be two bedrooms and a small kitchen and a smaller living room. But then the community has a larger, you know, dining room oh, that, open uh, space yeah, area. larger entertainment areas, those kinds of things that are then shared. So Tom, like co-working where we go into a larger building and, and multiple people occupy the same space, co-living, is uh, is just accepting a smaller dedicated space and then living uh, uh, with uh, some shared amenities among all the inhabitants. Well, that, that I'm, I've saved an article that I'll share with with the group about a 33 acre co housing development in Bethany, uh, Connecticut, near New Haven, yeah. and it it appears to be separate but joined townhouse type construction. And it sounded interesting. In this case, they had income qualified units and so on. Uh, it, it seemed interesting, but I'd never heard about it or seen the term. And apparently there are five of them in New York state. The, unfortunately, the headline, it's a full page article in the Sunday Times, a dream that died in debt, sadly, but doesn't mean it doesn't work, but a, a concept I've never heard of. Yeah, the article, like the headline is kind of harrowing. I read the article, you know, it talks about this one specific project that didn't work out, but then goes on to say there's multiple of them that do work. Yeah, well, that's, I wonder where the five are in New York State that we might benefit from not reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on an affordability side, but originally um, the solar home village was intended to be that way. It was oh, going to be like a right. 900 square foot dedicated space and then a larger common area. Well, th this project that failed, this, some of it was financing, some of it was stupidity. They weren't on public sewer and water, which is really a goofy thing to have, you know, 
high density housing without public water or sewer. And it took a long time to develop. It's, you know, it's like five years old and still never came to fruition. But was this we, intended to be permanent housing or transitional yes, housing? Ab absolutely permanent housing? permanent housing. They were, you know, school teachers, retirees, and so on that had put money down and it up, but it also relied relied on some kind of governmental subsidies. So could they sell their particular unit if they wanted it's, to move out of there? I believe so. Like I said, I, I will share the article with Karen and maybe she can put it online, but it'd be good to at least find out what similar communities supposedly exist in New York State. Mm -hmm. So it's, I know it's, we had talked about doing that with transitional housing. You know. No, they're, they're, these look like attached Permanent. townhomes. Is, is there a database that gives you, that New York State has for the different types of support for affordable housing? throughout the state I, you know it, like I, this is just an accident that i found this yeah. out about cordland uh, tompkins um it, it, thanks to you right yeah not not that i'm aware of though that certainly would be handy um i, I don't know of a specific database that lists all of the resources for for affordable housing my mom suggested to governor Hall. <laughs> <laughs> um but, uh, but yeah, certainly. But this Karen, you you could go on the HUD exchange. It's called HUD exchange, just that, um, and that should get you in to look at all of the federally um, subsidized programs, and also let you know when there are fees are open. Yeah, and I will, you know, not specific to shared equity models, but you know, a lot of. The state funding comes through HCR, Home to Community Renewal, mm -hmm. so their website has a good resource for, for that kind of thing as well. Um, yeah, just throwing out ideas here that I haven't haven't fully investigated this to know whether there's uh, a functioning model in this, but thinking about past conversations that we've had as a group with DeMarco and other developers that use um, low-income tax credit mm -hmm. dollars to do rental. Um, and we kind of talked about the challenges of applying that to home ownership. I don't know if there's a good model out there for like a lease to own program that would allow you to use LIHTC dollars on the front end during a during a you know lease period that converts to ownership mm -hmm. on the back end. Um, I I see I've done a little bit of digging. I see that there are some some places that have done that, but I haven't yet been able to determine whether it's a good model or whether it's if you had the same kind of the ability to restrict it in the same way that you're talking about on shared equity it could it could potentially work i mean the challenge obviously with the with the tax credits is that you have to they have to retain the use for the duration of the tax credit period right, right? yes yeah, so you're probably talking 10 15 years yeah. before you could convert yeah exactly yeah um so in doing something like this, um, I know that Pathstone has this first time home homeowner um, grant subsidy, whatever you call it. And so can can a um, a potential homeowner, can they tap into that to achieve a shared equity? Um, yeah. I, I think potentially. Um, so that would open the door to the lower level of the um, market that we determined really needs some help, frankly. Yeah, it's funny. I was just thinking, you know, to get at what the town board has asked for, you know, to get at an ownership conversation, you almost have to unpack like every part of of a, of the cost structure attributed to home ownership, exactly. and um, and then work it the way you I mean you just. You, just, you may have just solved the land cost question, right? right? right. If we could get, if we could come up I, with And that. I understand that that's actually a minor. Or, well, it could be, or it could be, I mean, in, the, in a place like Canandaigua or, or this part of Ontario County, even it could be more substantial than, than, yeah. than you know, originally thought. Um, and so we unpack all of those, all of those different elements. And there's some things that, and, and there's a different way to control each of them. What I want to make sure though, that we're, that we are thinking about is, or that we are separating is, um, credit 
or like occupant performance, right? All those types of issues have to be pulled out of that equation. We don't, you never want to bank the unbankable, right? That you just put people in a tough, in a, in a, a bad situation into a worse situation. And so um, first time home buyer programs uh, where we're, where we're going to give some cash to the, uh, to the equation, we're going to say, we're going to underwrite it. We're going to give you $7,500 uh, to, to get started. My banker friends always ask me, why didn't they have 7,500? Why weren't they able to save the seventy five hundred to get uh, to get into the into the ownership game? Well, because the income's too tight, because their expenses and yeah, exactly. Well, because that you know owning a home means all of these different things, means all these different expense categories. So what we want to do, make sure that we're doing, I should say, is that we're attacking the expense side of the equation, and then and then uh, addressing the homeowner performance side our financial performance side um, differently, if at all, if that's even in our charge. Um, so you could, I would think on the land, on the land cost side, we just talked about how to address, the, how to address that. There's probably co cooperative buying programs on the materials side. And I know there are, yeah. some, you know, if you buy in bulk, it, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a bit uh, less expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then and there's uh, organizations that have um, builder organizations similar to the solar factory that does all of the, uh, most of the building in-house and, uh, and then sets it. Yeah. And uh, I know that New Energy Works, my company, does that with the exterior walls. Um, and there are some other companies that, that do that, and it, it provides more affordability. Uh, and of course, they're in a whole different, they're, they're not an affordable housing company, but it, it reduces the, the labor costs that are required to take the materials and make them into a home. Yeah. And this goes back to a, a broader um, a broader conversation than the town, because I don't think this condition exists in the town. But in the city, you have the condition of underutilized, even vacant, existing single family exactly. homes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a model that I know Habitat has poked around at in, in, uh, in a lot of different ways. and. If, if you take a model like Habitat and apply it to existing single family homes, you bring that cost of, sometimes you bring the cost of producing the home down even further, right? And give us more, you know, we do more in a year than we could with just greenfield sites. Just this, oh, sorry. just this week, I've had several <clears throat> economic development related conversations or meetings where the topic of affordable housing, affordable transportation continuously comes up as, as it's getting more and more attention. I did have a conversation this week with the county administrator and and there's at least interest in exploring maybe this on a larger level on, on maybe doing something at the county level. I know I just read yesterday that the mayor of Rochester has now formed a task force yeah, right on that. affordable and and really and the governor obviously has proposed something as part of her budget. I wonder if we should be having a conversation Matt, maybe we can put on our economic development hats and have a conversation with Vinny Esposito or somebody to see if maybe the uh, Finger Lakes region would consider this a priority, and maybe you know that would directly involve the state in it that way. Yeah. And the Finger Lakes Housing Consortium might be a place to start with that, um, because because well, actually, they take into account more than Ontario County, but they're primarily Ontario County and they're considered the Ontario County housing, uh, whatever they want to call it. But I know there are people from Wayne County and Seneca County in, in the meeting that I attended. Um, I personally think this should be on the county level. And I personally think that the Board of Supervisors should embrace this and take this as a goal countywide. And it might not be something that Victor would embrace or 
Victor would embrace because <laughs> they're they're, uh, they're no one makes too many enemies too quickly. So. Uh, whatever. One, one day. But yeah. but look at Habitat. They purchased that house in Farmington, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I happen to know who owned that house previously. Right. And uh, and I know they beat it into the ground. <laughs> um, but it's in a fairly it's in a nice neighborhood. It is. A great I happen Christmas. to live in it. <laughs> uh, great Christmas <laughs> decorations. Yes. Anyway, yeah. so certainly that house has more value than what the um, recipient of it is is able to afford. Right. Uh, on her own. Right. So um, I agree that you know there are places probably available. There are places available in all our communities, but it needs to be looked at countywide. You know, it needs to Shortsville, it needs uh, Clifton Springs, all these places. Uh, I told Josh a story yesterday, and um, so maybe ten years ago, uh, when I stopped being in California. I came back and I participated in every one of the Ontario County tax auctions. So I'll give an example. I had a gentleman, his name is Billy. He has a family, his wife and the daughter at the time. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they lived over in Cottage City and they were paying $900 for a thousand square feet. Ranch, kind of rough. So what I did with Billy, I knew that he was a carpenter. And um, I bought the property across from the, whatever that's called in Bristol Center, that gas station, Traders or something, I don't know what the name it is. And um, <clears throat> I bought it for 24000 at auction. I then gave him $30,000 to make it habitable and livable for his family. Uh, he spent that money. Then I gave him a $56,000 mortgage that I privately funded for him, okay? And I gave it to him at market rate. Actually, I was a little aggressive on him, at 6%. And he pays me $310 a month, okay? And he was paying $900 a month across the lake. So what I get excited about in this affordable housing is different ways of thinking, right? You know, and I, I would say that there are, um, over the course of a, a number of years, we purchased, you know, probably a, a 10 uh, tax foreclosed on houses. Right? Some you can't even look at because you can't get there at all, right? But it's not a heroic, and the people want to not live in a $900, $900 per month knockdown cottage on Cottage City. And, and, it's just leveraging the strength of the community. You know, whether we put incentives in for those folks that, that they acquire their house some way, there could be some attachment to, uh, you know, from a tax perspective or just other incentives. But these, there's there's people out there that, that really need this. Yes. And, and it's been, I can't overemphasize the craziness of the last year. It's been a crazy last year, last two years we're gonna say, right? And it's now unaffordable. <laughs> You don't talk about affordable housing anymore. You only can talk about unaffordable housing. That's what it all is. And I think if we start to change the approach, the thought process, and you know some of the ideas that I'm working on, and, and I, I think we can put something together that that would be a, uh, and you can't you know run to run to uh, Hopewell or run to Seneca and tell them they have to be you know you got to show the way exactly. You got to exactly. show them the way and make them jealous for not being in the system. Right? Sorry, you can't come in now yet. Okay, um, we'll do that for one hour and we'll admit. But if you but, have but, a, I mean, if you have a leadership right, in a county, right, as we do, right, right. Um, <clears throat> and on the economic development right. level, and you, and you know I know, because I hear this repeatedly, right. month after month after month, we want, we need to have affordable workforce housing. Right. And in the last meeting two weeks ago, it was only the second time I've heard it, but it was from two separate companies. We need affordable workforce 
transportation, because both of these companies have people who don't own okay. vehicles. Both of those. I, and I mean, this is what's happened to the world, our world. Right. We have people who are just scraping by right. to get the basics, as some of these people up here say. Um, frankly, you know, you know, some of you know, I do work in third world countries. I go to Nicaragua, I sleep on a board with a mat on it. I use a latrine because they don't have indoor plumbing. Mm -hmm. Potable water in Nicaragua, Nicaragua was a spigot outside the front door, 10 feet from the front door. These people have a better lifestyle than the people in the U.S. who are eligible for our for affordable housing. The people, the market that we looked to develop affordable, affordable housing for. Because they have a roof, roof over their head, they have schools that their children are able to attend, they uh, are getting an education, they have cell phones, and in many cases they have electric. Uh, and, and to in their environment, they're better off than these people in our community who can't afford to buy a house or to pay more than $600 for an apartment. Uh, and I, I'm telling you, I've seen it firsthand. So going to that tax auction idea, and this maybe goes back to kind of elevating this to the county level, that the town doesn't do their own property tax auction, nope. right? So that's all through the county. Right? So, I wonder if there would be an opportunity, and I don't know the mechanics and whether the county even has the ability to, but for there to be some sort of a set aside or, or preference for bids for affordable housing developers, right? right? So the, those, you're not bidding against the whole field right. if you are designating this project as this is gonna be an affordable housing, or whether it's a single family home. Yeah, or auction is always or, uh, interesting. Is it ever? I mean, you know, and, and it's it's from one extreme to another extreme in the course of a year, right? And the behavior, and it, you are absolutely right, Nash, that exposing that to, you know, 10 different people that are interested, all that does is drive up the price. Right. right you know? And uh, so. But perhaps a consortium could make well, that's use good. of something like that. Right, I right. mean, we, we, did, we bought a cottage on the Erie Canal in Port Gibson, which right. is a one mile stretch of Ontario County, and I'm going to go off topic here. It does not have potable water. The water comes into the well directly from the canal. Yeah, yeah. And a mile down the road, you can see the sewer going into the canal from the Newark system. Uh, so no potable water in the US of A. I mean, I am beside myself about it. But you got that piece of property dirt cheap. It's a beautiful piece of property. You sit there, you're right on the water, you know, it's like. That's and I'll cheap. tell you that <laughs> anybody that can't afford an apartment, they'd be happy to stay there. Mm -hmm. So that and then end of my well, comment. Well, so much if of I could, If I could circle back, are the, the houses that you're saying are vacant in the county, um, are they ones that are for sale because they were foreclosed on? Tax are they? They didn't pay their taxes, Brenda. It's a tax foreclosure. Yep, it's a foreclosure. And it's, it's an auction every year. They they have this neat little book, booklet. You can uh, travel around, look at the places ahead of town, time, and uh, you just go and, you know, bid on it. It's a lot of fun to attend. <laughs> well, sort of. Because <laughs> uh, I've also been, it's, it's an interesting, weird process. Anyway, well, you you got to pay, you gotta pay cash, cash uh, right, right. on the barrel head that day. Uh, cash money, baby. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, it's, and Greg was probably the most scrupulous person at the uh, event. There's not always a lot of scrupulous investors there. Um, I was going to suggest, you know, Gre Gre Greg had a, as usual, his his insight is is right. You gotta you gotta look at this, you know, completely differently than you would you know, than two you years would ago. Any right. anything you've ever thought about in right. housing, uh, for that reason, I was I was uh, reminded of uh, there's a, a guy over in Seneca County 
who is associated with the Finger Lakes um, Housing Consortium. Uh, he's the president of Generations Bank, mm -hmm. um, a guy named Menzo Case. Um, and years ago, when he first recognized this uh, transportation problem, he said, I'll never crack, I'll never figure out how to crack rural public transit. It can't be done. Like, he just threw away the idea of trying to crack that. And instead, he created a lending model um, to help people who otherwise couldn't get cars, get cars. And he called the program Wheels to Work. And the concept was uh, for somebody with uh, with great credit, I can get, let's, I'm gonna use numbers that don't mean anything now, but I can give them a car loan for 5%. Um, so I'm gonna loan, uh, I'm gonna loan someone, I'm gonna, uh, but for someone with not great credit, I can give them a car loan at 7%. I make money at 5%. The rest is just risk. So he would take the extra 2% and put it into an account that was in the person's name under the custody of Generations Bank. And as long as you came in every, you know, every month, month your payment, right? with your payment and, you know, uh, and you showed you were working, it wasn't enough to have a payment. You had to show, continue to show that you still had a job. That money continued to accrue in the account. And when you had a car problem, you took money out of that account. So you needed new tires, the money came from that account. Your radiator blew and you weren't expecting it, the money could, could come out of that account. And he and I talked at the time about a similar housing model, housing. right? Because the total cost of ownership of housing is what kills people. Yeah. If you're barely making your mortgage, then when your hot water heater blows, you don't make your mortgage. Because you gotta put the you gotta fix the hot water heater. Uh, the bank will give you 90 days, the, the, the hot water heater won't, right? So. Um, so that was the conversation Menzo and I were having five years ago. I can't imagine what where his level of thinking is now. It might be fun to have a conversation with him because he is involved on the Finger Lakes level around affordable housing. Something else I want to point out that's a, that's going to be a, you know a bit of a troubling statistic. When we first put the report together for this, when we were first uh, brainstorming numbers, the numbers we were able to access were the twenty. 15 ACS numbers, um, 20, which are roughly roughly based on the 2010 uh, census numbers. The 2020 census number now for Canandaigua, the average house or the household median income uh, is $85,000, um, which we know is virtually meaningless in this nice. conversation, right? Okay. $85,000 is the median in the town. So we're going to have to think about where we push, put that pin in the in the in the uh, now the now that's household per capita it's still around forty five thousand um, average average per capita income is about forty five thousand uh, dollars when we looked at the Lions Bank CSR or the or the Pactive line worker it was on the order of fifty thousand dollars like twenty that's work that's what I call workforce housing mm -hmm. right right um, trying to crack the nut on 50% of of per capita how of per capita um, income for how home ownership is a I hate to say it this way but it's it's not a not worthwhile conversation so I understand where the town where the town board is going the town board wants us to focus on on ownership as an opportunity mm -hmm. I think that ownership uh, conversation needs to come at the household level. Right. Um, so I, I agree at 50% of household, household income, right. median income, we're talking now about $45,000, which is still tough for a home ownership conversation. So we might have to ratchet that up a bit to, to 60,000 or so, which still puts us in that workforce housing conversation. And then these other, so other solutions we're working to develop should still be focused on, on any attainable housing rental, any safe attainable housing. Hi, this is Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Sarah. Okay. Hey. Um, just coming from home ownership counseling. Um, what I do day in and day out, um, 45, 50,000 is still very high um, for workforce, I would say. Um, a lot of the clients I see definitely do not make that much. Um, so I, I understand, you know, looking at the statistics and the numbers. Um, I have a feeling that the high earning statistics 
uh, may be kind of skewing the, the median. Um, but if we're looking to make sure that home ownership is affordable in the long run, we need to look at rehabbing and making the home as up to date as possible. I mean, God forbid, you know, there's emergencies and accidents, but the aging housing stock that is available to the lowest income earners is just, you're, we're setting them up for failure. Um, I have a client, like literally I'm sitting outside the attorney office that I helped her close <laughs> just now. Um, she does not make very much income and we set her up with USDA direct mortgage loan. She has FSS to home ownership set up. We gave her a grant for 35,000 for rehab and she was able to bump up her USDA mortgage an additional $10,000 so that she could replace the roof and loop it all into her mortgage. So I love the idea of, you know, the, the post purchase um, savings aspect, but the, the housing stock is just, is just old and it needs so much rehab that the lower income homeowners that do purchase them, we're going to see them back in a couple of years because they can't afford their mortgage and they'll have huge repairs. That's a countywide conversation, right? Because the town doesn't have that doesn't have that problem in no. large part. It's a, right. The town housing stock is you know, eighty percent built after nineteen ninety. Right. But um, the, the city does. The city, city does. Can the city. And some of the other, and that's why I say it really needs to be on a county, county level. Because I mean, yeah. you can go to Geneva, and of course they have in the city of Geneva they have it. Schwartzville does, um, some Clifton, of the, yeah. Clifton does, um, you know, you, we really need to look at it on a larger scale. The, the thing that, that really, really disturbs me about the town board pushing toward owner occupied affordable housing is that there is a market out there that is in dire need of affordable housing. and it can't be done piece by piece by piece. We need to have, we have waiting lists on affordable apartments. I mean, I've heard 57 on one, 36 on another, and I don't, and those are just two within the town limits, two. It's it just these are the people that really need help. They're the ones that need an apartment for in the six hundred dollar a month range, and then and and still be able to to have money to buy food, transportation, etc. That's what we need, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, I think that there's something for everybody to do relative to this issue and there's so many different levels i mean we have a we have a fantastic example of exactly what you're talking about karen on county road 10 in creekfield and we worked with demarco and we've had demarco here right those so there's four phases for that the only phase that's currently constructed are the 96 units of phase one with a waiting list of 170 I know. right yeah. right but why isn't phase two built it's not because of the town of canada well we've been trying everything we can it's because the state money hasn't come to help well, because you know, it's so, a lottery and what a stupid system right so it's what like stupid there's so system. many different layers to this issue for everybody to work on and we've got to get more involvement from the state and empire state development and some of those programs but, but right. the way to do it is to have more power behind us and to have more power behind us requires a larger a larger section of the population that require I, I believe the Ontario, Ontario County, which has probably one of the better rates of economic development of the, any of the counties in New York State. I believe they would have the power to push some of these, um, for example, the DeMarco development through and, the, and it's just um, it's ludicrous to <clears> think 
that you know you're going to pick a number out of a hat depending or or depend on who's going to advocate for you so you have someone who has a big name that advocates for you and you get the money that's not right that's not right that's not equitable <laughs> um back to you know people needing money for repairs it almost seems like there needs to be some kind of community insurance. You know, somebody buys a home and, and they're income eligible, and then they pay, you know, a little bit each month into an insurance policy. You know, as you talked about with the, the what the banks were doing with the mortgages, so that when there is a repair, um, somebody comes and fixes it. And, and that's where nonprofit organizations come in, in the affordable housing, uh, element because they have the capability of working with future homeowners or renters on things that require maintenance and caretaking and how to accomplish it how to do it you know how to change a light bulb how to uh, get a new hot water i mean if you go on facebook you see ludicrous questions how do i do this how do i do that Right. Well, hello, you've all got these phones. It's on there. You know? <laughs> well, and if you could marry it with a community program like a BOCES or someplace where they're training people to be plumbers or they're training people, you know, to be carpenters, um, you know, and use some of those folks as a, a training opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be a really nice program. So what you guys are describing right now is called post-purchase housing counseling. <laughs> um, so there, I mean, there could be funding and grants and opportunities to um, really match up with housing counseling agencies as well as other networking, um, uh, you know, departments and, and other agencies that could work together to do that. So there might be you know, funding out there, we would just have to get maybe creative with it um, and marry a couple different programs together. And I would want to piggyback on that and say there, again, for a lot of the customers who may be facing uh, some housing issues um, and uh, they run up on uh, times where they need to just need some assistance to trying to get repairs or trying to make upgrades. You know, a, a lot of customers who qualify for Department of Social Service or low income um, customers, there are programs already out there available to them um, that they can get those assistance. And even if they're not the homeowner themselves and they're just renting the, the address, depending on the location and what needs to be done, um, there are programs, uh, weatherization, empower programs, there, that can help customers do it. Um, it is just that it would be up to the tenant and the landlord to work to ensure all the proper paperwork is done so they can receive whatever assistance it is. And, and a lot of those are helping to make the house more comfortable, more affordable, and make their um, trying to lessen their energy burden also. Uh, and all those things are going to help to give those tenants or give those uh, residents um, the opportunity to have more money in their pocket so they can pay other things. Um, that's, and that's one way to make it more affordable. But again, uh, it is working with the, the property owner and the tenants, um, if they're not the, the owner occupied, and making sure they apply for the services that's already available. So you don't have to try to recreate something. Use the services that are already available now. I'm looking at this. Uh, in the, for for those on Zoom in the room, Doug, Doug uh, uh, broke out uh, a a bunch of components of conservation investments in the town, and I think there's a similar effort to be made for the um, for housing for affordable housing, right? Uh, you know, this idea. I think to Kevin's point, you know, if we if we create new programs or stack resources in a place where that's already happening then those are resources that aren't going someplace where, you know, where, where they're needed. And so an inventory, and, I, and Karen was getting at it earlier, an inventory of every resource exactly. out there. Because yeah. um, we're all people who 
pretty passionate about this and we're in the know on a lot of this stuff and we're blind to a, to a, another a whole section of it. Right. Right. Kevin just described what Sarah talked about. Those are programs that at least I, I didn't have any idea existed. Oh, I, I know there's programs, there's especially programs in the cities, uh, especially for uh, rehab and, and um, maintenance uh, issues in the cities. Um, I'm hard put to find a program for a municipality like the town of Canandaigua. But that's that's why I think many of us think it needs to be on a wider level because as Kevin stated, if you had an inventory of those programs and maintain it at a level that, that you know, the average person that's looking for affordable housing frankly, doesn't have the time or the energy to go looking for these services. They have to be brought brought to light. And uh, it, it just needs to be done on a larger scale than 15 or 20 people sitting in a room talking about it. And uh, so I'm looking for ideas on how to do that. But I don't know. I think we need to go to the Board of Supervisors. I'm not good talking in front of the Board of Supervisors, so I think somebody need, uh, needs to... Um... Anybody, Doug, before you leave, do you know who the chair of the planning um, mm -hmm. committee of the BOS is? I don't do. It's, uh, it's not uh, Mr. Gorm, is it? Fred Probably. Lightfoot? No, he has facilities or something, I think. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Because that's where you'd have to start. I think right. you got where, the, where, the, with the, who? Planning, planning committee. Planning committee. And you don't know who's on that. I can figure it out right now. Yeah, real quick. If it's Fred, that's great because I know Fred really Fred. well. Do we currently offer um, some kind of a tax benefit or some kind of incentive for landlords to? Um, rehab property and use it for low-income housing? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of either. Kevin, do you know of any uh, program like that? Yeah, there, if um, a lot of programs right now are geared towards having um, the property owner switch over from any like fossil fuels um, to switch over to a new clean heating and cooling technology. Um, as New York State tries, you know, move closer towards uh, electrification of, of the state. Um, so there are different benefits that offer them if they have an older type heating system to upgrade to something that's more energy efficient, get rid of some of the fossil fuel. Um, and there are some tax incentive and some monies uh, available to help um, with that, whether they're the owner occupied or if they're just, uh, if they're just the owner um, and in this investment property. So there are funds available for that. Again, it's one where um, the owners need to kind of know about know about these, seek um, information for it, and then we um, kind of walk them through that process of letting them know what's available. Uh, past stones have their own, or the housing council has their own um, information to help landlords uh, to qualify for different services out there too. Uh, a lot of cases, a, a lot of the property owners only come where they're in uh, dire straits. Okay, I need a new roof. I need to have this help. I need this. And usually these programs are not really kind of built to help with emergency situations, but to do some future for forecasting of how they want to upgrade their property and make it more affordable um, to keep, you know, their tenants uh, comfortable and, and again, get rid of some of the old fossil fuels and improve their property's image and, and hopefully network. So I want, but there I is want a tendency to... right now for property owners to um, purchase a large number of rental units, um, you know, fix them up, make the price high and not rent to people who need affordable housing. Um, so I was wondering if there was some kind of distinct incentive that could be provided um, to someone who was going to do that. That's where you see a lot more people who are where, where I've seen you know, a lot more people consider it to do the land trust so they can ensure the that trust. they can keep um, the, the properties dedicated 
to whatever specific communities that they're looking at or specific um, income level to, to keep the house more affordable. It, you know, we're just living in a time right now where um, the ability to, to, to make money off the ownership of homes is high. <coughs> property values is pretty high <laughs> across the board. If you own property, um, you can get top dollar for renting. Um, and even if you want to turn it over, if you get property, buy low, pretty standard thing, buy low, fix it up, sell high, here's your profit margin. So there's a lot of people who are taking advantage of that. So the, the, the thought of looking at uh, making it more affordable, um, you really have to be passionate about it because that has to override your, your, your greed, so to speak. I just want to comment on, I, I'm trying to get really crazy now for a second. I'm saying there are no more towns. And the whole system of affordable housing is mapped against employment locations. Okay, so there's no towns, there's no regulations, there's just, and the people that can't get to work, that crumbles this plan. So I'm, I'm will, willing to have Maybe I can go map it myself, I'm not sure, but like take Pactive, I don't know what their number of employees are, 1400, I'll make up a number, right? The VA has got a good number. Those are probably higher end jobs, nurses and aides and so forth and so on, but but map out where the employers are, okay? And I don't, you know, and if Shortsville's got, Shortsville's got Leonard, or Manchester's got Leonard's now over there, right? They got uh, the uh, Finger Lakes Mulch and Soil Company over there, okay? I've been on both properties of late, and they, um, uh, the people that are working there are working their asses off. Okay? Yeah, they are. And if, and if they can't get to work, they're not going to get paid for that day, right? So I just think you got to, we got to think, again, just a different way to think about it. Solve the problem with a different equation, right? And, and I believe if you're not employable, that's, a, that's, a, that's another conversation. But if you're employable and you can't get there, because you don't make the fifty thousand, you make the thirty-two thousand that year because you can't get to work. You know, and and I like the linkage to the car strategy. And they get two percent to hold back. I think that's a great idea, but I think it's got to be a little more holistic. Okay, for these are tough problems. If they were if they were easy to solve, they would have been solved already. You know, and as far as the, the Demarco property and other properties that people invest in, it's a shame. I agree with you. It's a shame to get hoodwinked. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, hoodwink is what's happened here. And uh, so I, I just think there's a requirement to think differently about it. And that's all I'll say. Thank you for it. Greg, just to piggyback on that, I've had two conversations this week with two manufacturing related or indirectly, right. but two manufacturing facilities, <coughs> one in Canada and one in Geneva. It's my understanding that both facilities, neither one, are running at 100% because right. they specifically are requesting affordable housing near them. For exactly the problem that you're saying, uh, they need the labor, and then they need the housing near that. Um, Typically within cases. walking distance, ideally, at least, ideally, or at least right, something right. close, right? And that's where you know, I, I it was interesting that they to me it really got my attention that this was on the governor's radar. Now, we can all criticize you know how that was going about, especially as local municipalities and and local zoning and and all that, right? But the topic of affordable housing was on the radar enough that she put it in the budget, right? And so, especially my gut would tell me after the pushback that happened this past week, there's probably not too many municipalities that are raising their hands saying, hey, if you want to talk about affordable housing, come visit us. Maybe there's an opportunity for us as, a, as an entity, either the town or the county or whatever the case. And, and I do go back to you know, there are regional representatives. We've talked about Lenny before, right here in the region. Again, at least getting him to a meeting where we sit down at the table and have those types of conversations because this, the affordable housing need is there, but there's a direct correlation to um, economic development and jobs. There's also a direct correlation, Tom mentioned it earlier, and I have talked about it so much this week, infrastructure, water, sewer, and those types of things. And it's all connected. It's hard to have one without all of those things together. I love the idea of going, you know, basically going to Vinny or somebody and saying, going on the offensive and saying, hey, we believed in the governor's vision. We're disappointed to see it go. 
there's always a pot of governor money laying around out there that could help us accelerate the conversation. Yeah. So did you, did you find the planning? Yes, uh, Drew Wickham is the chair. I don't know him. He's from Seneca. Seneca. He's a good Seneca. guy. I know him. I'm Cornell Gray, really good guy. Lugard, Fred Lightfoot, um, Mark Benuti, Restola, Phillips, Dave Phillips, Manchester. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know Mark and Lou and Drew. Oh, I know Fred. Are we gonna? Are we stepping on Tom? I'm with. By the way, I'm also with Greg on using a different equation to get the right answer. But are we? Do, do we? Should we call Tom Harvey? Is that how I you do don't. do that, or do you? <laughs> I you know truthfully, I think there needs to be a conversation with the county administrator. It's on his radar. I just talked to him yesterday. He's interested in having the dialogue. Yeah. Well. I've already called him a nasty name. You seem like you want to be the person. <laughs> Sometimes that's a compliment, you know. Yeah. You know? Tom or Chris? Chris. Mm -hmm. oh, Tom, okay. I know from Rotary. So <laughs> well, I mean, Doug's already, you know, Doug's already made that intro. Maybe we go back and have a you sure. know, more focused okay. conversation, and and then just offer to. You just say this woman's sitting over here. We don't know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there, we're, I know we're in a couple of different places, but the and the answer almost always is scale, right? That's what that's what solves a lot of these problems is just getting it up to a to a scale where it starts to make financial sense. Exactly. Um, so, um, who's the um, city person that's on your LDC team? I can't remember his name. Um, city of of uh, Canandaigua. It's uh, Tom, Tom Lyons. Lyons. Okay, so he works for Wayne County. That's correct. All right, so I've attended the affordable housing meeting in Wayne County, actually, and I've attended one remotely. And um, I, I would bet if we could get interest from Ontario County in making this countywide, we could also join with Wayne County because I know I know that they're anxious to have more. That's power. a purpose of going to Vinny. People right. they want more yeah, power sure. behind, behind nine them. Nine counties. Yeah. yeah. Not right. two. Nine. Right. What? Nine counties, not two counties. We could get well I mean, but you know, you have to work one at a time, Greg. Well, Come well on. with Vinny though, Vinny has that sphere of influence we go exactly to, i right, agree Vinny and to paul lavin at uh, genesee finger lakes regional planning council and right. say yeah we want to look at this on at this both of those guys have the same scale but in the meantime you build you know you build some smaller coalitions um so ontario county doesn't have a land bank right we do not no yeah. wayne county does wayne county does Santa county. county does yeah um, yeah so, so that may be something else to look at yeah the Albany County Land Bank. We just did a project with them, and they have an automatic. Uh, the the uh, land bank has first right of first refusal on all the tax sale properties okay. um, to the point where they took too many. <laughs> that was our <laughs> our job was to go in and look at it, you know, try to develop a strategy for disposing of some of these properties. But I mean, in a couple of years, they got seven hundred fifty properties um, on, through that process. And, um, Livingston County isn't quite, it's not quite as automatic, but they have a conversation in Livingston County, the land bank has a conversation uh, with the county board about, about the tax sale properties out there. So in Ontario County, we don't need them all. We don't need them in Bristol or in, in, uh, you know, someplace far flung. We need them close to employment. So. Bristol is going to be the peak of the world soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest job market expansion you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. But there is power in numbers. Yep. Uh -huh. And we have to we have to think about that. So um somebody want to contact Chris to vote? Yeah, Doug and I can. Okay. I'm due for a call with him anyway, um habitat related stuff, so I will also yeah. okay. mention the okay. I think the more desires of the committee and, and, and yeah, right yeah. that helps, yeah. right? And I'll be nice to him. And, uh, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> promise. Break that down, call. please. <laughs> well, your signature on that. I actually can contact Tom, Tom mm -hmm. Harvey, and uh, I can contact Fred Lightfoot. Yeah, you should. Fred and I have a good relationship. Yeah. 
Lou, I know Lou Gard gets it. He was on my uh, Geneva LDC board, and we were wrestling with a lot of the same stuff. Um, Mark Renuti's approachable, no question. Fred Willie is another one that uh, I, I feel comfortable with. Take it, Pete Inglesby has told me personally there is no problem. No affordable housing problem? No, no affordable housing problem. No, no. And I honestly don't know what Jack Marin thinks. I can find out. Um, I probably know a few more. So anybody else have anything they, you know, we're going to try to make this bigger. I, I think, and I see nodding heads here. Um, we'll do what we can in this next month and and uh, and see what happens from there. But um, stay in touch with me if you have, you know, I preach, think outside the box here because the box this is in is not a very pretty one. And uh, I, I think we need to start thinking differently and start bringing in ideas that other people would be afraid to, to bring up. And I mean, if, if you go online, you see I, there's there's a place in Minnesota that I really didn't delve into very deeply, but is being very successful in the affordable housing thing. And in Texas and California, of course, is is really big on it. But uh, if you, if you hear of these things, bring them to our attention and we'll uh, do what, it, what I've, you want. I've got a question or suggestion for Doug. Um, the outhouse property, are there any strings attached to how that property is used? If the, if the town gave that to a developer that's serviced with sewer and water, that would put housing close to Pactiv, certainly. And if the developer got it, cheap or free because it's municipally owned is is that an ads or is german brothers land cheaper than it would be in uptown for housing so i would describe the property the first property you referenced not with strings but chains um, <laughs> and the second parcel would be available but um you know, I believe the current market price is fifteen thousand dollars an acre or somewhere Wrong. between fifteen and twenty. Twenty-two five. Oh, I'm sorry, it's gone Did up. Did you get correct in these numbers, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that that's that's five. more expensive than than across three thirty-two. Same well, in Randy's Randy's backyard. I've been hearing new numbers for the form base code area where you're talking a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand an acre. Well, it's it, the German Brothers is dirt cheap. Pardon the pun. But going back to uh, outhouse, that's that's a non-starter. Yeah, I I don't know how so many we restrictions would do right? that. Um, you'd almost have to repurchase it from right. the open space fund that was originally used to purchase it. <laughs> so. Hmm. But, uh, but going back to it. Tom, going back to German Brothers property, it's a great property because a new Y is going up right there across right. the street. Yeah, mm -hmm. you talk about walkable, right? employment, child care, and everything right mm -hmm. there. It's a great idea. There's some height limitations there because of the airport, but it's still a great idea. Where is the German Brothers property? Across from it? Happiness no. House. Not in this blood. Kidding. <laughs> kidding. Across from the Civic Center, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Civic Center. On the Sands property, isn't it more across from Happiness House? It's up it, a little farther. It's up. Yeah, a little. It's, it's 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 further west. It's further east. East, further east. Get yeah. your compass out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and Happiness House, do they have any more? I mean, they were approved for so many. They're not built out yet. They They're have not. More. How Correct. many more are they able to? I think, I want to say they were, and this off the top of my head, Sean, I think it's gone. I think it was eight units, eight buildings there. And yeah. I think there's currently three or four. Three, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I think they're and, not quite halfway. 
and yeah. the the bigger ones have not been built. Correct. Yeah, you know, and again, it, their problem is where to get the money as well. They they actually compete with DeMarco and the other entities to get money. the money yeah, to build this, these units in the town of Canada. Yeah, I know they do. Yeah. Well, I, I, the reason I ask is I was talking to someone who just was approved for senior housing because their newest unit is a senior housing. And uh, this person's pretty much said it was a lifesaver. Yeah. We've been talking with um, Cornerstone Builders and they're quite interested in building something in Canandaigua. Um, and so they would really like to have a meeting to find out um, what properties are available for them to do it. Um, but they're looking to put a proposal together. Give them Doug's information, Brenda. Yeah, I'm happy to. He's happy to, he'll, he'll meet with anybody. Do we have a date set for builders to come? We don't yet. Should we be looking at that or should, Doug? Well, well, I know with DeMarco, I, they had told us that they're waiting for the price of building materials to come down before they build. It could be a long way. Yeah, it could be a long good, way. Good, yeah, good luck. I think yes. that I think there's a tremendous opportunity to start to network and, and introduce some of these different things and even share with, you know, this group Cornerstone, and I'm sure that there's others, even our vision of uptown and that area and, and kind of the groundwork, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, even if nothing else is just sharing information and planting seeds. Yeah, they so, built Happiness House. So could we put together a uh, communication, a letter or a packet of information and uh, send it to sure. potential builders? Um, an update well, from the town of Canada, but that's all. Right. Yeah. I would also recommend that not the Doug write that or you didn't do that because yeah, that's Doug pretty good did. work. He, he probably did it. Yeah, right? Doug did that. Okay. Yeah, you can read so, it. So <laughs> there should be a town of Canada affordable housing strategy. I used to do them on 11 by 17 pieces of paper and I would make my teams give me their strategy. Anyone did not match mine, I fired them. Because okay. <laughs> I, I don't have time to train these people. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but my point is that that there's got to be a public map so people can talk about that element or that element or that element. And they're, and they're, they're you're right, there you, should be. Right. You have to realize we only started I, meeting I'm, I'm in not July. Being Karen, you know I love you. I know. You know that, okay, okay. All right, that's Sorry. not disputed. Okay. So I'll volunteer to do that. How's that crap here? And, and that is part of our 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 goals is to develop a strategy yeah. but 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 to ask but one question that haven't been mapped yet yes is that's gonna be a pretty pretty busy guy right. yeah you know and i just want to i just want to there's you got to start with a strategy written can't be verbal can't be part of a strategy it's got to be laid out you can cross things off later on but that would then drive your yearly activity and there's more i mean there are multiple legs here i mean we know we heard we heard from the uh, right. town board, what their what their priority is, it's it's ownership, and so that's a leg. Right. And mm -hmm. that we know that uh, that employers have need, requirements. Yeah, we're going to need a we're going to need a workforce piece. We're going to need a, a more deeply subsidized piece, and we're going to you know, and all of those will have different strategies. They're all those are all legs. Transportation's an issue. Transportation. Um, um, when are the auctions held for the the public property? In May, in May usually every year. I don't know if they're back on schedule now. Um, last one was in October. I just saw the notification. It's coming up, but it's ironically, it's the lowest number of parcels to be auctioned off in well, the history. Surprising. So it's. I think they said there's either eleven or thirteen or something or other. There's not very many this year. Yeah. Do you is it so with cities? The cities make the determination whether to kick it to the auction. The towns have the same. Mm -hmm. no. the, the cities the also, collects, but the cities a lot of times do, or at least right. the city of Canada. Right. Does. The um, White Springs Road. Yeah. We bought a house over there, and uh, same story, right? You find you put the plan together, they execute the plan, then you everybody's happy. Yeah. 
That's why I'm asking for the plan. Yep. For Does case. Habitat so. use that? Do, do they um, look at the uh, tax options for purchasing property to? Uh, we have considered it a few times, but as you guys alluded to, it's, it can be very competitive and, you know, you have inter cash right interesting there. cast of characters. And yeah, so we have not not uh, purchased anything at auction in the past. But the most controversial lot that went that I was involved with on behalf of the town of Canandaigua was a storm control pond. Right behind uh, uh, Butler Road, just oh, up yes, 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 yes. And then I was threatened. Good thing I had Jim Fletcher with me. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I hesitate to even say this because I don't want to shift the focus away from affordable housing in any way. But I think another th thing for this committee to, to think about is part of the reason we have the problem that we have with affordable housing is that the, the lack of housing in general is a big issue. And so even influencing creation of, of housing at a little bit higher than what we're looking for can benefit it filters right. up right, right, right. Yeah. um you know still want to, to keep a focus but next, you know right. so there may be some opportunities for this committee to influence some things at a more market rate that would create higher levels of housing in the community at the same time that we and you tackle to... you kill two birds right so an example of it's probably a bad way of saying that but an example of this is senior housing right mm -hmm. so seniors right. in ontario county occupy a very large percentage of homes that were built before 1980, mm -hmm. right? Which would tr traditionally be more affordable. So if we created opportunities for seniors to move into uh, a new product, then that vacates those. And there was an article uh, in the paper not too long ago regard regarding that, that um, everyone thinks in terms of building the actual affordable housing units, yeah. but in fact, building the higher, uh, more expensive units actually pushes affordable housing forward because it, it removes the stress on the, the lower priced units. So uh, you have these people that can afford these upper priced units and they're they're happy and it leaves some of the others available to the people that really need it. Yeah, I don't know that we can build at a scale that would, you know, you can solve the low end problem by just focusing on no. the middle, but I think there may be more mechanisms that the town has at its disposal to influence market rate housing um, in the short term while we try to look at pulling together some of these longer, you know, more complex strategies um, that would be worth exploring as well. And the other thing I think we should explore with uh, with uh, building homes in, in our area is um, negotiating terms, having incentives for builders to have say so many x number of marketplace and x number of affordable because it's important that the this housing not not stand aside it's important that it be part of the full community um so do like incentive and, zoning programs where we intensify density we yeah right yeah inside. So while you're writing up our goals, you can include those um, things. August. Okay. Yeah, because I think if we can if we can influence you know builders and developers to shift a little bit less attention on the four hundred thousand plus category and more into that you know two seventy five. But it's an economic three. equation. It's all right, right. So we have to solve the economic equation before they'll react to it. But you right. know, you yeah, know so what? Yeah, so you do though? that through. Right. Incentives, yeah, incentives or whatever available. High end builders are interested in it. And, you, and I worked for a high end builder for 24 freaking years, right? <laughs> and, and my favorite expression was I wanted someone that built a million dollar home and I want them to pay me cash. I don't want to deal with mortgages. And do you know that 95% of the time that's the way it was? Mm -hmm. However, my boss, and it's got to be 20 years ago, came up with this tiny home. Thing. I mean, here he has a company that specializes in million dollar homes, and he was willing to take a risk on tiny homes. And, and, and you know, that's, that's a favorite expression of mine, because tiny homes would solve the problem, but nobody wants to hear about tiny homes in a place like Canandaigua. So, uh, or even accessory dwellings right. would also be a big, put, a dent, put a dent in the yeah. problem, but nobody wants to hear about those right. either. 
Um, so I think that we're short it's time short changing developers. I, I do believe that there are developers that build the expensive homes that are also interested in looking at the affordable market. Um, it's just you know give them the space to to pursue it give them give them the ear to pursue it that's what's really important uh, you know uh, jonathan is all everything he said just landed on dead ears nobody wanted to listen to it anything else so our newest member here, Greg was I'm not a member. Is going to, <laughs> I will not is going be a member. To, I'm sorry. Uh, well, he's not, not a member. member. He's an adjunct. A adjunct, adjunct. adjunt. <laughs> he's going to come up with a strategy for us. I, I will come up with a documentation that reflects the current thinking that we will morph together yeah. into a strategy. Yes. And that's all. That, yeah, but we can do that. Okay. okay. Good. As long as it fits on 11 by 17. 11 by 17. <laughs> that's the rule. <laughs> Doesn't make it, doesn't make it. Okay. Uh, we've lost a whole bunch of people. So, yeah, hi, you are. Hi, um, just listening, this is only my second meeting, so, and I'm thrilled that Habitat is involved because when they first came to the area, my husband was on the board, and so, you know, my heart is there. Who's your husband? Um, he's passed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, discussion about first time home ownership, which I'm really for. Um, with personal experience, I remember when we first got married, my husband was taking care of several family members. I wasn't, I was a stay at home and we were really short on cash. So we're looking for a place to rent our first time. And the realtor was awesome. She said, if you looked into ownership, no, we couldn't afford it. She says, come with me. She showed us, it was small. We were measuring, we couldn't fit our, at the time, huge couch. It didn't even go diagonally into the room. But it was our first home and ownership did it's so big, much mm -hmm. to us. We owned a home and you can't put a price tag well, on that. And, and I agree with you. And our, my first, our first home was a subsidized home also. It was new, it was Sir Ryan Homes, it was in Henrietta. And, and we moved from a hole of an apartment next to the Genesee Brewery on St. Paul Street where we had rats running through the hallway. I mean, just really, and we were able to move into that home. And so I agree with you, but the tide has turned and the young people are not as interested in having a permanent home at the ages that we did. Uh, you know, I was, I was like, what, 24, 25, whatever, you know. Um, there are, the young people now are looking at purchasing a home at a, at a later age. They want to have the flexibility of being able to move and follow their career path or their job market and, and not be tied to a home. So there, there's probably an equal market for apartment living and home ownership. Yeah, I'll go back. Well, first of all, we didn't live in a gated community, but it wasn't subsidized. But yeah. um, no, mine at, was. At the time, it was brand new. It was home. nice, and I, yeah. and I agree with you. There was nothing like it. Nothing. Well, like we didn't it. look around to see, you know, what area we were living in. We were happy, um, but it it also allowed. We didn't plan ahead, but it allowed for equity buildup, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. when it was time to sell, we could I hate the term, but Leverage move that. up, right, right. you know, exactly. if we wanted to. Um, and uh, what was it? The survey that I think you did for the comp, the new comp yeah. plan, uh, was heavily weighted towards first-time home ownership, or I, I can't remember if it was that or lower. It income. was for the uh, yeah for the comp plan, and yeah. there there was a good. Portion I was surprised at the uh, amount of home percentage exactly. that was interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I don't know if I should ask this now, but. Do you have minutes of each meeting? No, we're a team. We're, we're a project team, and we're not required to take minutes, from what I understand. So but how does most the of the meetings, but they're on. Uh, they're, they're, recorded, they're recorded, and so they're on YouTube. They're so you can actually YouTube. watch the meetings. Yeah, oh. you can actually. Uh, they're all go there. Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube. And, and like, could I go on it tomorrow? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I've, I've actually been on it. Yeah. All the affordable housing yeah. meetings are on it. They're there. Okay. Um, and how do we keep in touch with what's going on between meetings? Um, 
like, I don't know if people would have showed up if they knew that Habitat was going to be represented. I was thrilled when I found out. Well, they, I just knew that. I just found that out this morning. Oh, okay. I just, right. Yeah, but I, I was communicating with Nash this morning. Um, there, there, Sarah, I'll have Sarah put your information on the email that she sends it out, sends out each Month. Is there an is there an agenda on that email? Yes, the, I usually don't take a, yeah. a little bit of yeah. an agenda, That's but it changed at the last minute because uh, uh, we were that supposed happens. to have a person from Pathstone who was going to talk about Jesus. grant opportunities, and she wasn't able to make it. But in that meantime, I had uncovered the shared shared equity homeownership, and I asked him. That's that. interesting. He's okay, up. you know. I'd let him come more often. Is he all right? <laughs> He's credible. Yes. <laughs> but I'll have. I'll Thank have you. Sarah put we your still have two people. Thank there. you for. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks, Thanks Brenda. Brenda. See you. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Dave.